Hi. I'm getting ready now to introduce Constantine. I'm trying to figure out how to talk about what I have been learning. The first thing, I guess, to introduce it is to go back to the Popeless thing. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to buy Dr. Williams' book, but basically he shows a story of a mixture of deliberate gaming and misunderstanding that led to this idea of a populist. It started with a guy named Hegesippus about the mid-second um, century, about 150, 165 or so, really. And about five years within him afterwards is Irenaeus. Now, you saw, hopefully, in the Holy Hegesippus videos that, at least the first two, the Hegesippus was really, um, how do I put this? Hegesippus's big interest was being able to say that Christianity was all over the place and stable, and that it had somebody in every city who was teaching right according to Hegesippus. The second thing he was trying to establish was that this teaching was going all the way back to Christ and out of his ignorance he based it on Jewishness. Now that's the fatal argument because if you don't know the Jewish law and especially if you don't know Abraham then you get caught in your argument. You can't have it both ways. You know, he's thinking they're the new Israel. And that was common to be thinking that in his day. All right, it got even more as time went on. But if you're the new Israel and you're a successor from the old, then you have to establish that you have the same basis as the old, but you don't. Because Christ is not of the right tribe to be of the old Israel, and that's the theme of Hebrews 10, especially 7 through 10. Because the theme in Hebrews is the opposite of what the Roman Catholic Church is contending. The Roman Catholic Church is contending that they're old, I mean, they're not Roman Catholic yet. I'm going to get to that part. The church that represents, that's going to be what Hegesippus represents, okay, is basing its claim because they're Hellenistic. And in Hellenistic culture, and a lot of other cultures around the world, old means true. The idea that if something has continued and continued and continued for a long time, something must be right with it. We all have that same idea today, we can understand. Okay, but the book of Hebrews is telling you the exact opposite. Something entirely new is created. That's what Matthew 16, 18 says. Petre. That's what Christ is saying. I will build my church upon this rock. Petre. Bedrock used 104 times in the Old Testament Greek, okay? It's new. It's not the old. It's a break with the old. That's the whole theme of the book of Hebrews, is why is there a break with the old? All right? And, and it has to do with two things. First, Israel rejected Christ, and time was going to end because she did that. And second, because he had an older, personal, covenant from God, Kata Melchizedek, which is the expression of Psalm 110, for beating Satan, which is primordial. It's as old as it gets and you're totally new because he's a king without a kingdom when he dies. So where's that kingdom going to come from? 
That's the theme of the Book of Hebrews. It's in something entirely new. So for the Hegesippus to be thinking of old Israel and that it's a succession if it's a continuance of old Israel is completely antithetical to the New Testament. It's called New Testament for that reason. It's a break. Ekaine diateke is in Hebrews 9. Specifically saying, because Christ died, a new testament is established. Not anything like the past. Okay? Now, in law, you always have principles that were true in the past that get reconfigured in any new covenant. New testament, new will. But the will itself and the terms themselves are based on something that breaks precedent if it's new. So Hegesippus is not aware of, maybe he didn't have a book of Hebrews. All he wants to do is say, James is a Jew, and the Jews in the Old Testament were priests, and James was really elected the head of the Jerusalem church, and he had a second hat as an apostle, the Hegesippus is all confused about those distinctions. And what he, all he's trying to do is establish that Christianity is venerable because it's old. He's not thinking of a papal hierarchy. He's thinking of belongingness. And he bases it on the Judaism rules. So he clearly is completely mixed up. And in his discourse, if you read Hegesippus' writing, and I showed you where you can get it, link was in the sidebar, you know, video description, he's doing a round-robin trip to see if the right bishops, and that just means teacher, are in each city to say, see, Christianity's big, it's got a lot of adherence, it's based on something old, it's stable, it deserves respect. That's how this thing got started. Well, Irenaeus then picks that up, and he's got somebody else, the Valentinians, who are basically making the same argument that they go all the way back to the apostles, but they have an oral tradition and he refutes them by saying, I'm sorry, it has to be in writing. Yeah, right back at you, Irenaeus. Because he then takes Hegesippus' work, knowingly or unknowingly, it's not quite clear, and takes all those names that Hegesippus compiled based on Jewishness, continues the argument of New Israel, hi, we're older than you, and basically argues back to the Valentinians that whatever succession they claim to have from apostles, the list that Irenaeus has is longer and older than theirs. Okay, still the merits of the Bible are being completely ignored. What the Bible says is no, it's a break. It's a break because the Jews rejected Christ. But see, if you want to claim you're the new Israel, you, you can't afford to, you have to pitch out that Bible. So that's what Irenaeus does. Still in the Hellenistic, even though it's more Latin, he's arguing from Gaul, Lyon, actually. He's got to keep saying backwards, backwards. But see, but, but the Bible completely refutes that. But, that's their culture at that time. And again, he's not saying that there's papal authority. He's not talking about an ecclesiastical hierarchy. He's talking about some kind of unbroken line of teachers that he claims what he believes is what they taught. Just like the Valentinians are claiming that they go back to the apostles and what they say is what the apostles said. Okay, so you got two different groups of people, really many more, but those two in particular, were both saying that they go back to the apostles and the doctrines and everything that they espouse goes back in this continuous line all the way back. Who are you going to believe? 
The only way you can evaluate that is to look at the holy book that they're both arguing over and see which side the holy book agrees with the most. Okay? And the problem that they both have is the holy book doesn't agree with either one of them. Because the holy book is saying, hi, I'm sorry, past doesn't count. This is new. So the arguments on both sides are wrong. There's no secret knowledge. Book of Hebrews tells you that in chapter 1, that everything only comes through the Son. It only comes in writing. And Paul had already established that back in 1 Corinthians 13. So, hello. The book is disagreeing with both sides. But they don't care about the book. So then the next guy on the list, to carry this list of successions, claim successions all the way back. All right? He's a guy named Julius Africanus. And, you know, Irenaeus was about 170 AD. So now we have to go fast forward to 217, 222. And this is where it really gets interesting. Hopefully you've seen enough of my videos on Paul now to know that those meters, those syllables, are meters for years AD. And at this point, we're entering into verse 9, musterion, hidden, a synonym for pregnancy, you know, life hidden, waiting to be born, theme of Ephesians 3 coming up in Paul's book. Okay, the meter of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, in verse 9, is now solidly on the word musterion, and we're entering into the second Eudokian anaphora. And that's the period of the severance. Julia Mamea, Julia Sol Mea, I forget how to say her name properly, and Julia Domna, the mom, who was married to Septimus Severus. Okay? They were very much into pagan religion. They were very much into monarchical structures. And by the time that you, you get to 222, 221, 222, and Julius Africanus is around, and then within 10 years, less than 10 years, Hippolytus and Origen is right in there also. They had suddenly gotten some kind of, how do you want to call it, favor, which was a big switch from the Severan persecution, even though it wasn't that great. It still happened to some extent. Now they're in favor with the mothers, hidden in favor with the mothers. And in fact, there's a competition going on between Hippolytus and Origen over getting the favor of the empress. That's in Rome. And the empress, who's you know, kids at this point, or Heliogobulus, who's just established the sun cult, but he doesn't last too long because he gets killed. Okay? By the plotting of the mothers, he gets killed. And that puts Alexander Severus on the throne during this time. And Severus is one of these eclectical, religious kids. He's only a teenager. And he has little statues. He has Lars. Lars is a Roman term for little ancestor gods. Okay, you know, like in the movie Gladiator, when you see Russell Crowe ki kiss those little statues, those are called Laris. Okay, Severus had Laris made of Moses and Jesus, and I forget who else, I think Buddha or something, I'm not sure. So they were listening, and Origen and Hippolytus, who had been friends for a long time, were suddenly in competition. And so now everybody kind of wants to grab favor with the Empress. So you got sitting way over in Alexandria, where our boy Origen originally came from, but he's on a trip in Rome. You got a guy named Demetrius who wants to sort of like take, kick the sails out of Origen. So he was working with Julius Africanus on this pope list. And the reason for them to do the pope list at that time was to impress the empress. You with me? And all this stuff is hidden going on behind the scenes. Perfect word, mysterious for this period. Everybody's trying to work for the good pleasure, 
That's the Eudokian anaphora in that section of the Empress and totally ignoring the Emperor of the Universe. <clears throat> See how, how satirical Paul's language is. I mean, this, this, I was just, this book just really shocks me how it fits what Paul says together with an angle I didn't know. Okay. So now you got, you got, look at, look, you got too many cooks in the soup. You got Julius Africanus in Rome. You got Origen in Rome. You got Hippolytus in Rome. Back in Alexandria, where Origen comes from, is Demetrius, who's kind of jealous for something. Okay? And all of a sudden, they want to be, they want to show unity. They want to show that the church is really strong and old and goes back, you know, this long line of successors because that was the hallmark, the hallmark of Septimus Severus's reign. When he came to power, he claimed a kind of ancestry from Antoninus Pius and Marcus Aurelius, skipping over, you know, Commodus in the Civil War, the mini Civil War that occurred after Commodus, to try and stabilize it. So he's claiming a continuity that doesn't exist. Okay, but so are they. So they're real hot to make this bishop list now. And, and again, it's not yet papal authority, but there's a subtle shift that changes. Okay, their first goal is to show that Christianity is established. It's old. They've already got a sort of willing ear because, you know, Severus Alexander likes the idea. You know, all this is sort of, this is post Apollo, okay? Um, Severus kind of likes the idea, he's pro-Jewish, he's kind of pro-Christian, and he's a teenager, what do you expect? Okay? So what they want to do is they want to build their case to the Empress. So this thing with the bishop list is suddenly front and center, it's real hot. Okay, but because it's hot and because Demetrius doesn't like origin, this is real so Demetrius doesn't like Origen and wants Origen ousted, and Hippolytus is in Rome, and Africanus is in Rome, and Demetrius is helping Africanus with the Pope list because Africanus is composing one of Roman prelates and of Alexandrian prelates. And so Demetrius convinces Africanus, and then there's a lot of debate exactly how this came about. But suddenly, the list that Irenaeus had had, which they were working with, suddenly changes. The list that Irenaeus had from Hegesippus and Irenaeus, you know, juggled with it a little bit, had Peter and Paul, like, as a preface, and then starts listing the so-called bishops with Linus, Linus being the first. But in the next incarnation with Africanus and Hippolytus, with Demetrius behind the scenes to both of them, all of a sudden, oh, in one of the versions of the list between Irenaeus and Julius Africanus had included Paul. Okay, so it was Peter and Paul, sort of as a preface, and then Linus was the first bishop of Rome, blah, 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 blah. And there were other bishops in other places that had just had the list. Okay, but Demetrius wants to undercut Origen, and the best way he figures out to do it is to give Rome, especially because they give the Empress, you know, hi, I'm in Rome, I'm the Empress. If we make Alexandria equal to Rome, then Rome doesn't look so good, and the Empress is in Rome, so we've got to make Rome superior. So the Empress will buy into Christianity. So suddenly they change the list, and all of a sudden, for the first time, Peter, they throw Paul off the list. Peter is on the list, is as an alleged bishop of Rome during Claudius. And Mark, who's allegedly, no proof of this, Peter's sidekick, is deemed the first bishop of Alexandria. Now see, because Mark is pitched as Peter's sidekick, 
that would put Alexandria below Rome that has the effect of promoting the Roman bishops. So therefore, they're the superior ones, and therefore the empress is to be more impressed that she's got both Hippolytus and um, Origen talking to her. Okay, but neither one of those two are the actual bishop at Rome. That's the problem. Now, Africanus is not a bishop either, but he, he's somewhere outside the picture. He's not getting an audience from her or something. Okay? Demetrius is working with him instead. All right? So in order to promote Christianity to the empress, it's important to promote Rome over Alexandria which Demetrius wants to do because then he can get a candidate for the Roman bishop because it was up for office at that point to turn against Origen. And he's able to convince Hippolytus to turn against his own friend Origen in the name of Christian unity in the name of selling Christianity to the Empress. Isn't that awful? So now suddenly for the first time, during the time of Claudius, which legally and historically in those days, Claudius had banned Christians and Jews from Rome. They claimed Peter was there during the time that Christians and Romans were, uh, Christians and Jews were banned. They claimed Mark at the same time, when he was way too young to have had that office, was the bishop at Alexandria. Julia Mamea isn't going to know the difference. She's the Empress. You know, the Empress Regent for son Severus Alexander. She's not going to know the difference. The whole thing was trumped up in the name of Christian unity, in the name of converting somebody to Christ. Have you heard that before? And still it wasn't pitched as a real papal authority, but it was for the first time pitched as Rome having a sort of monarchical supremacy because of the luster of Peter's name being there alone and first, suddenly. Paul, of course, who really was in Rome, is nowhere on the list. Now the other thing they're trying to do at the same time is beat up the Jews and the Christians who are waiting for the rapture. Okay? Rapture, millenarianism are all one piece, especially the Christians in those days. And Paul's meter is talking to that time as a crisis period in history. Now I can't prove it. But, you know, it's not too hard to understand if this brain out can see that in the meter. Certainly people who, you know, this was their native tongue, Greek. Greek and Latin were native. Somebody should have clued into it because Greek meter is famous. This isn't actually Greek, classical Greek meter. It's a Hebrew meter with Greek words, but it's got a cadence. It's got a rhythm, okay? And, you, and it reads like an Aristophanes play, especially if you know the past already. That's how come I can decipher it so well. So what about the people who were alive then? And everybody was expecting the second coming. And of course, that had to be preceded by seven years of rapture. So there's all kinds of apoc apocalyptic talk. So the other goal of that list, and especially on Hippolytus' end, well, Africanus was involved in it too, was to create this cockamamie idea that Christ was born 5,500 years from Adam, and that history had, he, Christ wasn't going to come back to year 6,000. That's a Jewish, that's Jewish dispensationalism. That's what the rapture is based on, which is, you know, the math is different in the Bible. It's 2,100 years, 2,100 years, and there's no guarantee that the third 2000 is going to happen. All right? It's implied, but, you know, it depends on when we mature. That's what Ephesians 4 is about that Paul will lead into when he's outlining in Ephesians 1. Okay, but they must have known something. 
to make such a big stink out of it because that's a crisis period in Paul's meter. That's how I'm getting a lot out of this book. Anyway, um, I think I'm going to take a break and come back and keep explaining.